turn. So the first one was a very basic question. What are the most common shunt options available? And how do you determine which shunt is preferable over the other? So why would you use a ventriculoperitoneal shunt, a VP shunt, uh, versus a VA, which is a ventriculoatrial shunt, uh, or a ventriculopleural shunt, or a lumboperitoneal shunt? So um, there's a f few ways to look at this. So first, you know, the, just so you understand, the ventriculoperitoneal shunt is the most common one that we do, and so that means a uh, shunt that goes from the uh, head um, underneath uh, the skin, so subcutaneously, to the abdomen, okay, and that's the commonest thing. Um, and why do we choose it over uh, the different ones? So the, with the pleural shunt, that means it goes from the head into the chest cavity, okay, just around the lungs, and a ventriculoatrial shunt is one that we place from the head. It goes uh, usually through one of the vessels in the neck to end up uh, just in the heart. Okay, and that's the atrium of the heart, so that's a ventriculoatrial shunt. And a lumboperitoneal shunt is completely different. That, instead of um, draining CSF from the head, it drains CSF from the, the lower spine and then drains into the belly. So lumbar peritoneal, okay? So um, I, I think part of the reason why we choose why VP shunt is the most common is because some of the unique complications that we see with these other shunts. So they all have some idiosyncrasies with them. So pleural shunts, um, uh, are draining into the chest cavity. And one of the complications they can have is if you get, get a buildup of the CSF in the chest, you can imagine that it might be hard to breathe, right? It compresses uh, the lungs. For most people, this is not a problem, but where uh, it's especially a problem is if you're very young and you've got a very small chest to begin with, so young babies tend not to do well with the ventricular pleural shunt for that reason, or if you have some other sort of compromise to the chest. Uh, one situation we often run into is somebody with a severe scoliosis and uh, uh, sort of restricted uh, chest compliance and, and uh, volume. So those are situations where we might want to avoid putting extra fluid in uh, and compressing the lungs. With the ventriculoatrial shunt, um, the shunt uh, draining into the, the heart cavity, um, one of the complications you can get from that is that the, the, the catheter can start developing blood clots on it. And um, it can block or it, those clots can, can um, uh, fracture off and then go to the lungs. Um, uh, and that, that can cause over long-term pulmonary hypertension or other problems with the, uh, with the lungs. And they're a little bit trickier to insert. I mean, we, 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 we do it uh, fairly routinely, but it is, uh, it is a slightly harder shunt to insert and to revise. So if you run into complications with them, it can be a bit more complicated. Uh, lumboperitoneal shunt, the, one of the unique complications with these is that um, you're, you're draining off fluid from the lower part of the spine. And uh, what that kind of does is it sort of sucks the fluid and the brain down. And so you can develop a secondary Chiari malformation, which means that the, um, uh, the, the lower part of the cerebellum of the brain uh, gets sucked down into the upper part of the spinal uh, area where it shouldn't be. Uh, usually that's tolerated, but sometimes that can cause problems. So that's one of the reasons we try to avoid that. And also it is a little bit trickier to, um, to insert. Um, and did you have any comments about that? Any? Well, thanks, Ab. That's, it's hard to add to that uh, presentation. Just one sec here. Um, my perspective is primarily the adult perspective. There we go. And um, for all the reasons that you've mentioned, I would say the, the peritoneal shunting is the commonest procedure we do. That's really the go-to procedure for most um, adults with hydrocephalus. Um, the only rash, the main reason we would change that is if we run into people who have peritoneal issues. So if somebody's had operations on their abdomen, a gallbladder taken out, an appendix taken out, operations for various abnormalities in the gut, you can run into problems where the gut just simply doesn't have the capacity to absorb the fluid that you're trying to put into it. And we would look for alternate options and usually the second place we would go to would be the lung. And in adults, Although the same issues can arise, of course, adults' uh, head to lung ratio, the, the lungs are much bigger and they usually will accommodate the fluid absorption in the lung. Um, the other condition that we tend to see in adulthood, which isn't really hydrocephalus, but it is along the spectrum that we think of as CSF disorders, is a condition referred to as idiopathic intracranial hypertension, where individuals will have very, very high pressures inside their head in spite of the fact that their ventricles are very, very small and uh, we still need to divert their spinal fluid in order to treat that condition. And although one can put shunts inside the brain under those conditions, 
putting shunts into very small ventricles carries with it a slightly higher risk than putting shunts into very big ventricles for obvious reasons, and we would tend to put shunts in the uh, lumbar cavity and then shunt that fluid into the abdominal space. Um, I, I'm not really sure, Ab, about the, uh, the Chiari complication, whether that is more a result of the growing child. Uh, we don't tend to see it very often in adulthood. So once, first, as your spine is growing and you're siphoning fluid off the lumbar spine, as Ab was saying, the risk is that the lower parts of the brain tend to come into the upper part of the spinal canal. In a full-grown adult, we tend not to see that. So the lumboperitoneal shunt is a little more acceptable in adult condition. The other thing that I think we'll talk a little bit more about when we talk about ETVs is this concept of hydrocephalus that is communicating hydrocephalus and hydrocephalus that is non-communicating hydrocephalus. We make spinal fluid in the ventricles of the brain and that fluid has to get out of the ventricles and then it travels around the spinal canal, comes up, travels around the brain and gets absorbed. If the fluid doesn't get out of the ventricular system, and there are a number of reasons why that might be the case, then treating hydrocephalus by shunting fluid out of the lumbar spine doesn't make any sense at all because you're not really treating the fluid where it's blocked. That's, and a ventricular peritoneal shunt would really be the only option for that. So a lumboperitoneal shunt would be restricted to conditions that we refer to as communicating hydrocephalus. Okay, thank you.